I would like for you to take the word of God, please, and let's begin with the very first book of the Bible. If you have your Bible open to the book of Genesis, to a conversation God has with Abraham as God speaks to Abraham and about Abraham in the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis. I'm giving a message on faith for the family. We began our Christian home crusade and also our prayer vigil, the touch of heaven on every home. And so we're doing those two things simultaneously, doing all we can to reach families, new families with the gospel, and also trying to strengthen our own homes and families as we're praying in every home, asking God to guide us and help us. When I was just a boy, I did not grow up in a Christian home. I came to the Lord Jesus as a very young teenager and I got exposed to true biblical Christianity as a young man visiting in Christian homes, getting acquainted with boys and girls who were growing up in Christian homes. And I said to the Lord as a young Christian, this is the one thing I want. You could have asked me what I was gonna do with my life. I would say I want to be a coach. I grew up across the street from a high school and practiced and played with the ball teams in every sport. I thought the most influential people were coaches. And I had that in my mind. But whether I was gonna be a coach or not, I wanted a Christian home. When Evelyn and I knew that God wanted us together, I had that conversation with her and she agreed with that and said that's what we would work at. And so that was my goal. Now I'm dealing with that subject in this message. If you have your Bible open there to Genesis chapter 18, we'll begin reading in just a moment here with verse 11. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself saying, after I am waxed old, Shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark an expression in this 19th verse. I think this is an amazing verse. An amazing verse. He will command his children. He will command his children. Now the conversation, of course, is as this visit is being made with Abraham just before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot is caught in the middle of all of that. His family, they have backslidden, gotten away from God. And Abraham is deeply concerned about his nephew. And as these messengers of God visit with Abraham, they let Abraham know that God's gonna keep his word and Abraham's gonna have a son. This is the promised son. This is the Isaac we'll read about later. And without an Isaac, all the blessing, all the thing that God had promised would never come to pass. 
There had to be an Isaac. There had to be an heir. It couldn't happen without that heir. Now, Sarah, <laughs> 90 years old, and going to have a baby. And she says, as she's laughing inside, how are Abraham and I going to have this kind of thing happen? I'm, I'm past that time with women. And God answers back, listening to her heart, and says to her, is anything too hard for the Lord? And of course, when you and I hear that question all these centuries forward, we have to answer no. No. God can and will change things. He will. He can do what he pleases and will do what he pleases. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And then he makes this amazing statement about Abraham. He says, I know him. And God knows all of us, but what does he know about us? What does God know about us? He says, I know him. That he will command his children and his household after him. And that shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. Not only do I know Abraham, I know what he's going to do. He's going to have the right kind of family and he will keep the way of the Lord. Now that's an amazing statement. Does God know about us that we're going to keep the way of the Lord? God instituted family life. He created family. He established the home. He established government. Sinful people needed government to protect them from themselves. And he established the church. The Lord Jesus said, I will build my church and upon this rock. I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So if anyone asks you what has God done, he created the world. He established the home. He established government. And he established the church. And we ought to give special attention in the word of God to what God's intent was for this world and what God's intent was for the family and home, what God's intent was for government and what God's intent was for the church. Now, I want you to hold your place. We're coming right back, but I want you to hold your place here and turn all the way in the New Testament with me, please, to the book of Colossians and just list these family members in Colossians chapter 3. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as is fit in the Lord. I want you to mark that wives, please. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now there are many actions and many responses a man could have toward his wife, but God, interestingly enough, says this, never allow bitterness, a feeling that should not be there. Never allow it in your life. And then he says in verse 20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Some men and women marry and never have children. But when they do have children, they're fathers. And God has this word for fathers in verse 21. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Anger driven in, anger from hypocrisy on the part of parents, anger uh, from unrealistic expectations, demanding things of children that are unrealistic, demanding things of your children that don't make any sense at all because of a parent's hypocrisy. They can get discouraged and discouragement driven in makes them anger, filled with anger and they wanna, they wanna say something and do something they shouldn't do. And sort of sometimes when we wanna see the anger corrected, we need to think about how it got there. Now let's go back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 18. 
Because when God established a family, he established a family with responsibility. A family is the training ground for everything else in life. It's the place children are to be trained. It's also a place for children to be born. A family begets children. A man and a woman beget children. We reproduce. God said, be fruitful and multiply. A man and a woman. God designed a man and a woman to be able to do that, to have children. And when they have children, it's the primary responsibility of the family to educate those children. It's not the government's responsibility to educate children. It's not even a school's responsibility to educate children. Now, if a family chooses a certain school and says, I want my children in that particular school, and they're giving their responsibility to that school to educate their children, then they should do everything they could to encourage that school. But God gave the family the responsibility to train and teach their children. There are many people who homeschool, perfectly content doing that homeschooling. There are some folks who homeschool who shouldn't be homeschooling. Shocking. They don't have enough discipline to get their kids out of the rain and they want to train them all their life. I think sometimes parents need to go to school before they start trying to train their children and educate their children. Matter of fact, all parents need to be schooled from God's word about teaching and training their children. But I'm for homeschooling and pray for homeschoolers and ask God to bless and guide homeschoolers. As a matter of fact, if a Christian man or Christian woman decide this is where I'm going to put my children, it's their responsibility. God didn't give that to anybody else but you. That's your responsibility. And the government begins to take action when they shouldn't have to take it, but they think they have to, when the family keeps breaking down and breaking down and breaking down. In some sections of America, among certain people, 80%, 80% of the children grow up without a father in the home. We could read crime statistics, things that are done immorally. I can give you a long list of things. I know people now who are engaged in behavior that is illegal and they're ruining their lives. But no amount of statistics, no one out of four, half, 80%, whatever the case may be, is meaningful to anyone until it's personal to that person, until that thing has happened to you, to you. But the point needs to be made that parents are responsible. And it's not just the children, the entire family should move forward for God. The entire family. How is it we have faith for the family, faith in the family? How is it we have it? I want you to turn with me to the book of Romans just for a moment, would you please? And allow me just to read a few verses that lead to a verse that most all of you know. Romans chapter 10, we'll begin with verse 9. The Bible says that if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10, Romans chapter 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? Verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Notice the progression God makes here. Let's begin with verse 14. How then shall they call, you want to mark that word call? 
on him in whom they have not believed. Would you mark the word believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? We need a preacher so they can hear, so they've heard, so they can believe, so they can call on the Lord. Because whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now we're talking about faith in a family. Faith, having faith. Your children and my children don't just have faith in Christ Jesus as Lord just because they were born to Christian parents. Every person must have his or her own personal experience with God. I hope God will help me. I pray God will help me as I'm trying to be serious about a home and family because sometimes people think if the wife makes it, that's great. If the husband makes it, that's great. If the kids make it, that's great. No, it's not great. The whole family is supposed to make it as a family, worshiping as a family, praying as a family, believing God as a family. The most horrible thing I could imagine, the most horrible thing I could imagine is families divided and pieced together and thrown apart. The whole family needs to move together toward God and for God. And the home was created for that. The greatest knowledge that ever comes to a home is the knowledge of God. The greatest knowledge that ever comes to a home is the knowledge of God. All of us have a knowledge of God, that there is a God. We have some light in us, not salvation light, but Jesus Christ lights everyone who comes in the world. And there's a light of conscience and the light of creation. We know there's a God. I've told you many times stories of young people who never heard about the Lord. And they knew there was a God. They had to have explained to them who that God is and the way of salvation. But faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's no greater aim, goal, there's no greater thing going on in a home than the whole family moving toward God, worshiping, worshiping the Lord together. Now this is gonna sound a little outrageous to some people, even in a place like this, but they ought to be worshiping the home regularly. Daily Bible reading, daily prayer, daily working, looking to the Lord, believing God. That's why I think every home ought to be singing. You say, I can't sing. Oh, yes, you can sing. If you've got Christ in your heart, you've got Christ in your heart, you can sing. You may not be a great singer, but you're singing a great song when you sing about Jesus. Amen. So get it in your heart. Get in your home. Get a hymn book in your home so that you can teach and admonish with singing hymns and songs and spiritual songs. We have just advocated, we just advocated our our responsibility. We've given it up in the home. We've given it to the Christian school. We've given it to some curriculum the home, some homeschooler makes. We've given it to the church. It's not the church's responsibility to rear your children. It's not the school's responsibility to take care of the Christian knowledge your kids need. That's every home moving toward God and teaching about God in their home. That's the way God designed it. There's no other design. And so many people get off track early, early. When you hold a little toddler in your hands or hold a newborn baby in your hands, you think mom and dad and I are gonna work together to bring this little one to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. We're gonna live a genuine Christian life so that they can see Christ in us. When they're able to understand and comprehend and have some thinking about who God is and how they can come to know him, they're gonna believe what they hear because they see it lived out in the life of mother and father. I would imagine that parents who name the name of Christ and say they're Christians have no greater time with guilt than the guilt they toss back and forth with the idea I should have, I could have, but I did not. Get serious about it. Make it the number one priority. There's no greater thing you do, none. Some parents need to pick up the phone or write a letter and call their children and say, you know, I want you to forgive me. And they're gonna say, for what? You're gonna say, because I failed you. I'm a Christian. 
And you know I want you to be a Christian, but I could have done so much better living the Christian life. I failed to the matter of not praying with you and teaching you to pray. I failed in the matter of not reading God's word with you and teaching you to love the Bible. I failed in not worshiping God in our home with a, with a worship in our home that looked to the Lord and believed God, singing about the Lord. When we talked about things in our home and we were all troubled, I failed in not saying to you, look, God is on his throne and he'll work through this and he'll bring it to pass if we just pray and trust him and believe him. That should be the attitude and the worship, the outlook in a Christian home. There's nothing like it. You see, the family is good, period, family. But a family can do so much good as a family. Now, I've been in the ministry half a century and I'm saying to you, there's no greater thing going on in a church than families worshiping God together. But the public worship should just reflect the private worship that they've grown up with in the home. One well, of the hurtful things I'm seeing so much of today, and I thank God there's no more of it in our church, but there's some of it, and any of it's enough to trouble me, is that granddaddy's in one church, and daddy's in another church, and children in another church. I used to didn't see that at all. People in a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church, and families near one another, sitting together, singing together, worshiping God together. There may be some things go wrong in a church morally, People have to have some change. There may be something go wrong in the church doctrinally and you can't stay there and support it. But when there's nothing morally or doctrinally, stay with it. You can make it better. You can get over things. You can heal things. God can work in a mighty way. Occasionally somebody says to me and says, I'm leaving. I said, tell me why. Well, no, I said, tell me why. Tell me why. Then I ask two questions. Is there something doctrinally wrong here? Are we off on some strange doctrine? Then I ask the second question. Is there moral failure here? And if there's not moral failure or doctrinal failure, you don't have a good reason to leave. You might as well get that down when you're not even thinking about it. You don't have a good reason to leave. Because it's Christ's body on this earth trying to propagate the gospel and get it God's word out and it's about families, family faith and family worship. Now, let me show you some things from the Bible and I want you just to mark the scriptures and we'll just do it quickly, just quickly. The most tragic thing we could have in our nation is found in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32 and I want you to read it with me. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, God is warning his people and he tells them about his people, how he found them. They're to remember verse seven of chapter 32, the days of old. They are remembering verse 10, how God found them in a waste howling wilderness. They're told in verse 15, Jerusalem is a pet name, or Jerusalem is a pet name. Now that's Jesse Enoch's name, by the way. Right here you find it in the Bible, his parents named because they were Christian people who knew the Lord. And this is the pet name God has for his people, a tender name. But here he says they've waxed fat and kicked. They forgot how good God was. He treated them like a child and they didn't thank him for it. And then the Bible says they got to the place in verse 17 where they sacrificed unto devils, not to God to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God at, that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation. And here's the expression. Children 
in whom is no faith. I'm talking about faith for the family. Can you imagine having a family that has no faith? Can you imagine having a child that grows up and has no faith? No faith. Their life is not anchored with God. They're like a wind blowing a leaf and no anchor, just drifting. They're on a stormy sea and nothing holding them in place. They have no faith. And God who raised these people up and formed them into a nation looked at them into a family and looked at them and said, now you become children in whom is no faith. There's no greater goal we will ever have, nothing we ought to be working harder at than keeping faith moving forward in our families. Faith for the family. Anything we can do, anything we can say, whatever we need to teach, keeping faith moving forward in our families. And I think so much more as we see the day of Christ approaching. I want you to be, I want you to be staggered by that thought that your beautiful children could grow up and someday be children in whom is no faith. Keep it right. Don't let them hear you're complaining and griping about things because they didn't go to suit you. You don't need that. Nothing will ever go to suit you and never go to suit me entirely. Nothing. But God is still the same. His word is true. He never fails us. That's the thing we've got to major on. No doubt about it. I want you to turn to the Psalms just for a moment. In Psalm 78, this is God's design. Give ear, O my people, Psalm 78, verse one. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. Verse four, chapter 78, Psalm 78. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praise of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. Look at verse six, that the generation to come might know. God's design is that one generation has faith. Let's imagine here I am. Here I am with my two sons, my wife and I, and we're trying to move forward in faith, reading God's word with them. They have a will. They can choose or choose not to or choose to, but thank God they learn to worship the Lord. That's at the heart of all of it. And as they learn to worship the Lord, they learn to serve the Lord. Then they have children, and they must pass it on. But they're not passing it on to their children only. Get this. They're to raise their children, my grandchildren, and to raise their children equipped to pass it on to their children. That's the way God intends for all this to be done, that every generation passes it to the next generation. And it's a serious matter. As a matter of fact, there's nothing more serious than this, nothing, nothing. And right on down the line. And if we want to blame a generation today that's alive that's not serving the Lord, worshiping God, and doesn't appear to have faith in God. If we see children in whom is no faith, turn around and look back at the generation that produced them. Something happened. Oh, may God help us. Look once again with me, would you please? To Jeremiah chapter six. God's people needed healing. They didn't need patching, they needed healing. Here's what families do, they have a problem, they say, well, let's fix that problem. You can't just fix that problem. It's a matter of faith, it's a matter of God and our attitude toward God and our faith in God. You can't just patch up something. We have to go back and do it the right way. In Jeremiah chapter six, the Bible talks about all of this and you come to the 14th verse and it says, they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. Saying peace, peace. When there is no peace, they've healed the hurt slightly. 
You see, if you discover, if you discover that a child can't read, the right kind of educator says, well, we don't just patch over that and say, oh, just skip over the words you don't know. No. They do remedial work on that. What is the remedial work? Well, ask our elementary teachers. You go back and teach them phonics. A says this, B says this, you see, C says this. Combination of letters say this. And you teach phonetical approach to reading and when you see a word you've never seen before, you put those pieces together and because of that remedial education, you can actually pronounce words and begin to read and you can almost imagine that person may be 20 years old but they're learning what a first grader learned because you had to go back to the beginning. In the matter of faith, there's no difference. There are people who are presidents of banks that have no faith in God. They should have gotten it in their family when they were growing up as children. There are people who are noted, reputation people who have no faith in God. How are they going to get it? Well, somebody says, well, maybe something bad will happen and they'll think, I've got to. Their vision of God will be all off. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We've got to go back to the beginning. God spoke the world into existence. This is the message of the Bible. These are the verses you need to know. These are the cornerstone truths, as the Bible calls them, the first oracles of God. These are the things you must know. And you put those things in place, forming pillars for life to believe in God believe in, and, and put your faith in God and you anchor it and you strengthen it and you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's homes everywhere that have nice houses, nice clothes, nice schools, nice cars, but no faith. And here's the amazing thing. People who have faith are able to help those who don't have faith. It's not just for our home. Our home is to show people how they can have faith in God. And may God help us. And you begin to talk to them about those things. Show them the word of God. Lead them to Christ. Bring them to the point where they have an opportunity to trust the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And you can live to be 60, 70, 80, 90 years old but you still need the same thing and I need the same thing that a six-year-old needs, a five-year-old needs, a 10-year-old needs. You need your own encounter with God. You need to worship God. And as you worship God, you'll grow in your knowledge of God and he'll enlarge in his, in his idea in your mind. You, you'll see God for who he is and he grows greater and greater and your faith will increase. He never changes, but our ideas of him change as we learn God's word. And as our faith is increased, we can ask God and believe God for greater things. That's the only way it works. And so, if we're not trying to reach families with the gospel and introduce them to Jesus Christ so that they're dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 1 says, at this moment, that they can be born again and have life in Christ and they can start to grow in that grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. You can help a man who's 40 years old with a young family, you can help him know Christ, then he can teach his family about Christ. That's the only way it can begin. And so I say to you, our job is not just to take care of our own, we gotta take care of our own. But our job is to reach others who do not have faith in God. And we've got to live it, believe it, teach it, preach it, and ask God to help us because there's no hope in this world anywhere without it. None. Let's pray together, man.